you've landed inside Launch Street, the business innovation podcast, where we interview top innovators out there shaking things up so you can innovate, differentiate, and get further, faster. Since you're here, we know you're the type of person that recognizes the importance of unlocking your innovation advantage so you can compete and win. And now, your host, the person that has worked with leading companies like Disney, Procter & Gamble, Aero Electronics, the U.S. Army Research Labs, and Red Robin on upping their innovation advantage, Tamara Gontor. Hey, Launch Street, Tamara here. Got a great interview for you today. Before we get started, I want to share a comment one of my clients said to me the other day. She said, the weight of it all feels so big and I'm so little, I can't possibly carry it all around on my shoulders. She was referring to all the pushback she feels she gets on her innovative ideas. All the not nows, it won't work, we don't have the structure for that, it'll cost too much. Pushback shows up in a lot of forms. I'm sure you know the phrases in your world that represent that pushback and all that weight on your shoulders. I share this with you because, as you know, if you've seen me speak or have access to our online toolkit in particular, having ideas, that's one part of innovation. But the other is getting buy-in for your ideas, getting people to listen without getting shut down like that out of the gate without getting those phrases that are like hitting brick walls. And as she was referring, it's so exhausting to hear that over and over again. So we got to work on not just being innovative, but communicating those ideas. So we have a bunch of videos about how to do this on our online toolkit. But for now, I want to leave you with one shift in perspective, one nugget about this. No matter the brilliance of your ideas, People don't like it when you push your brilliance onto them. It shuts them down immediately. I mean, how many times you've been in that meeting or had that conversation where you're thinking, duh, this idea obviously is like the solution that we need for our challenge. And the person on the other side just shuts it down. When you try to shove your thinking down their throats, it doesn't work. So I want you to ask yourself, am I bringing this person along for the journey and letting them move this idea, this solution forward with me, or am I pushing it on them? I bet you'll find, I know I'm guilty of this, more often than not, you are pushing it on them. When you shift to get them along for the journey with you, you get the buy-in you're looking for. That one little shift in how you present your ideas can make all the difference. Now, onto the show. Actually, it's kind of a good segue because today is all about energy management, so not getting exhausted. Um, Our guest, Chris Perez-Brown, is the author of several books, Free, Love, Love Your Work, Love Your Life, Wake Up, and Shine. He's also the founder of the training business, Up, Upping Your Elvis. I know, I know. What does Elvis have to do with business? That was my first question, too. Turns out, a lot. So let's listen in and find out. Chris, thank you so much for joining me today. I am very much looking forward to our conversation. Tomorrow, it's an absolute joy to be with you. All right. What's the one thing people would be surprised to learn about you? Um, good question. I think there's many surprises. Um, one more recent surprise. My, my daughter's just been signed by a record label and not to be outdone, I decided that I would be an artist. So I've just recorded and released my first song. How about that? Well, that first of all, congratulations to your daughter. Well, thank you. Yeah, yeah that's very exciting. And second, what is the song and where can I go listen to it later? Uh, I'm on Spotify. So it's Chris Barrez Brown and it's a song called Come On Lady. Um, so, uh, yeah, that was a new experiment for me. Well, how fun. Now, did you know how to sing, play, record, whatever it is before? Or did you teach yourself to do this? Well, I think deep down, I thought maybe I liked music and, and music liked me a little bit. I mean, I've, I've, I sang from an early age um, and then my voice broke and then it was horrible. So I had to relearn a bit. Um, I, I'm, a, I'm a, an enthusiastic but terrible guitarist. Um, but fortunately, I've got a friend who's a music producer who made things sound better. Um, so uh, a useful friend to have. Um, we all need a little help every now oh, and again. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, part of the reason I was asking you is uh, I was looking up some research about the mind and how the mind works. And one of the things it was talking about is that our brains are a lot more flexible and able to adapt. And if we give it new stimulus, like 
learning a new skill, for example, we actually create new connections and new synapses fire. And so this kind of old belief of our brains are the way they are at birth is really been proven to be untrue. So I was just curious as you learn to play, um, if that changed maybe kind of some of the skill set you had or just how you saw ways to solve problems even. Yeah, sure. I, I, I think anytime you do anything new and different, that's a creative challenge. Uh, you, you know, your brain has to adapt. This kind of neuroplasticity um, that we are we are given, which is an amazing gift. Um, it certainly um, means that we are not stuck and rigid. And this whole kind of personality typing stuff, therefore, I, I, you know, I don't really buy because we can change so fast. And certainly by going way out of my comfort zone and doing music, I have found that um, I've actually been a lot more adventurous in other things as a result. And I'm, I'm, I'm much happier to do stuff from a, from a blank sheet of paper. So it certainly has an impact, yeah. Oh, that's interesting. That's interesting. It also gives you that willingness to try new things. I hadn't thought of it that way, too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Let, let's dig into your kind of expertise and why I wanted to have you on the show. And one of the things that I heard you talk about and you, you wrote as well is that modern business and human beings clash. Why is that? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I just don't think we're designed for business and indeed vice versa. So um, a lot of it comes down to kind of our brain development and the way that we function and the way that modern business is designed. So some simple stuff like, um, you know, we've only got peak focus for 90 to 120 minutes a day. Um, and, and, and actually, we can hold relatively good focus for maybe up to five hours. And yet we all do these eight hour days um, and longer. And, um, and therefore, for a lot of that time, we're really not being as productive as we could be. Um, so, you know, that's an issue. We, we've got an inbuilt negativity bias, which means we are deeply fearful of change, you know, new and different things. And we, we can't really embrace it. And business is all about change, right? I mean, we're always trying to do new and different things. And therefore, actually, we need to understand how we can adapt our subconscious, I guess, reactions make them a bit more conscious as far as response is concerned. So, so that design doesn't work particularly well. Um, we're, we're born to move, and yet we spend a lot of our time static. Um, you know, so th there's all sorts of issues, I think, what we'll find. And then, and then, of course, we've got this other, you know, drive, which is, you know, finding our tribe. So we love to fit in, and therefore, we adapt our behavior depending on who we're with. And our, obviously, our tribe now is our business. And therefore, the next thing you know, we're, we're emulating the leaders, we're, we're socializing to the norms, and we're forgetting who we are. So there's a lot of issues, I think, around business. Um, I want to kind of break them down for a second. The, the chunking sure. thing that you were talking about, about 90 minutes, basically, is yeah. kind of our peak focus. It's fascinating to me because just the other day I was talking to someone. I was telling them how I used to feel really guilty because I do really intense work for 90 minutes. And then I felt like I needed a nap. I needed to walk around. Sure. Like I couldn't. I, I just started to wane. And I used to feel guilty for feeling like I constantly had to take these breaks um, yeah, in my work. Yeah. And then particularly with the napping, because I was like, how bad am I like that? I have to nap at two <laughs> o'clock for 20 minutes. Like how exhausted am I? This is ridiculous. Um, but then I really came to realize over time that that when I did that, those 90 minutes that I had were super, not just productive in the sense of I got a lot done, but the work I was doing was stronger and more innovative when I allowed that to happen. But I think kind of with what you're saying, you know, at these eight hour days or really for most of us, it's 12 hour days, let's face sure. it. Um, yeah, yeah. we're not rewarded for being smart about how we work. We're rewarded for putting the time we put in, which to your point is a little bit opposite of how we're actually supposed to operate. Uh, yeah, absolutely right. I mean, at the moment, you know, so many businesses and, you know, there are some who are changing, so this isn't all, them all, but the, by far the majority still see, see the talent as, you know, a scarce resource that they have to optimize. And therefore, it's all about, you know, how many hours do we get in? How do we get more from them that are, instead of thinking about actually, how do we, how do we tap more into their genius so that actually when they're doing work, it's the properly good stuff. And what you're doing brilliantly, by the way, is you're listening to that. So napping is, is a wonderful little dirty secret that a lot of us have. And and and, it, and you know it's it's genius because we are actually designed to be polyphasic. You know we're not supposed to just sleep once a day for eight hours. We, you know we're designed to nap. And actually, if you do that, you can top up your energy reserves and get better focus again. So that's exactly the sort of thing that that I love to do with companies. Get them to say actually what's needed here rather than what is prescribed as normal business practice. Because actually, if we break out of those norms and we become what I would call a positive deviant, we've got more of a chance to do brilliant work. Yeah, it's funny. I used to justify it. I get up at four o'clock in the morning. So I, I tell people, well, I have to nap around two or three, but oh, it's because I get up at four. 
But the reality is it's just a better way for me to work because I do it on the weekends sure. too <laughs> when I sleep in. So it just, but I used to feel so guilty about it, kind of to your point. I mean, the other thing I wanted to just break down and talk to you a little bit more about was your comment about change. Because I think that's a sure. really interesting one in a time that demands a lot of change. We have all these things kind of to what you were alluding to that hold us back from wanting to change like our lizard brain and, you know, fear yeah. and kind of the reticular activating system that's like nothing new, please. Um, sure. And kind of what I've come to realize over time, and I think that uh, I think it's Dan and um, God, what are their names? Dan and Chip Heath, I think. Hopefully, I'm saying that right. Their book sure, Switch. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. One of the things that I've come to realize, and I think they talk about it further in their book, is that um, I don't think people fear change. We change all the time, but we do fear being changed. So the impact it has on us personally, because that yeah. that becomes things that we need to do differently. Absolutely. Yeah. No. When we're in the driving seat, we're cool with it, right? Because that there's no danger there's no danger to us because we've chosen it it's when it's happening to us that we start to worry and become anxious because we're not quite sure how it's going to play out so absolutely right yep so okay so i'm glad we broke this down because i think that it's important for people to, out there to really understand first of all if you need to take a break every 90 minutes and walk around you're not being unproductive and it's not wasted time sometimes you just got a freaking break <laughs> like <laughs> and and the other thing i'd say is i think what that's helped me do is not multitask which doesn't work right you can't be your best when you're multitasking? No. So, I mean, again, there's been loads of research done on this. And actually, multitasking, it's a myth. We, we don't. What we do is we microtask. We do one thing in a very shallow way because we actually can't do things at the same time. So, so actually, there are certain things that you can do microtasking. So, if you're doing a bit of expenses and doing a phone call and, you know, surfing a bit of the Facebook because that's what you want, you can do that. But actually, there are certain things that need depth. And, um, and a lot of the work that I do is about creativity. And that real needs real focus and depth, and therefore multitasking is is uh, is a real problem for that. So learning how to manage that I think is important. And I'm, I'm a big fan of zoning things. So I'm, I'm a, I think in the morning. I am brilliant at thinking in the morning. I can go deep. I can be creative. I can do fantastic expansive work. The afternoon I'm not so good. So that's when I I do a bit more multitasky type stuff. I do more shallow stuff, and actually it fits me well. Yeah, it's interesting. It's interesting how we all work differently. Um, I yeah. want I want to get into one of the things you have is called upping your Elvis, which made me laugh at first because I just I actually think of Eddie Murphy doing the Elvis impression, which is where <laughs> I go. But what is upping your Elvis? So so that's my business. Um, it, 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 the name was inspired by Bono. So you have to blame him. Um, but he, he had this fantastic question when he was doing his third world debt campaign. He used to go into organizations and he wanted to work out who to play with really quickly. So he used to ask, who's Elvis around here? And I love that question because when you ask it, people can answer it immediately because what you're asking is, who is a bit of a brand, a bit of a maverick, they get stuff done, they break the rules, they've got loads of energy about them and they love it. And I fundamentally believe that business needs way more Elvis now than ever. And I'd also say that we've all got more Elvis to bring. So what we do is we help big organizations like Nike, Unilever, Coca-Cola, um, Roche, people like that, get more Elvis showing up in their people every day. And what I'm really talking about there is energy. How do they get their energy right so they can get their extraordinary on? That's what we're about. Let me ask you this question. Um, when you go into an organization, whether you're working with a small or a large team, how, what are the indicators to you that the energy on both sides, really, that the energy is either low and needs to be upped or that the energy is high and they need help sustaining? Uh, yeah, it's a good question. So, so for me, my litmus test um, on energy is, um, are people having fun and does it feel like it's easy? And if it does feel like it's fun and it's easy, you've got energy going for you. If you've got um, the energy wrong, it feels like hard work and people aren't enjoying it. And I know that's a very rudimentary way of doing it, but you know what? It's palpable. You can walk into a business and you can pick that up at 10 yards. And, um, and, and therefore, it's actually relatively easy for people to be able to self-diagnose. So, so that, that's usually when the energy is right. It's, it's easy and it's fun. Um, interestingly, when the energy is high, it's not necessarily great. Um, sometimes we have to bring the energy down slightly with groups because high, high energy might not be that productive. And I, I, I always joke when I work, when I work in – well, I, you know, I, I, if anyone out there has worked in South America, you know, sometimes we have to de-energize people just to get them more focused on what we're doing because actually they're so enthusiastic and so passionate. You actually need to sometimes corral them a little bit to get them onto the right things. And I, actually, I love that challenge. It's a fun challenge and they're great people to work with. But it, but it just demonstrates that actually there is a, a sweet energy band that isn't right at the top, but it's certainly not at the bottom, where actually it's engaged energy. It's energy that's sustainable and it means you can do proper work. 
So let's talk a little bit about energy um, since you've kind of taken this there, because one of your propositions is get your energy right and you'll get your extraordinary on. I yeah. want to back it up for a second. Why does energy, as you're talking about it, have such a big impact on business and people, really? Yeah. Well, to be honest, it's everything, isn't it? I mean, you know, if if, if we go back to kind of, um, you know, kind of Einstein and quantum physics, I mean, everything around us is energy and it's what gets us to work. It's what means that we have good days and bad days. And we, we all have some days where we go into work and we feel bulletproof. And regardless of what happens, we know it's going to go great because we've slept well, because we've looked after ourselves in nutrition, because actually we're doing work that we're excited about. All of those things add up to great energy. But we also know what it's like when we turn up and there's not enough coffee in the machine and, and we must have an emotional breakdown. <laughs> now, we, you know, we, we're the same people. Oh, oh. <laughs> it happens, right? Um, but we, you know, we're the same people on both those days. But we're going to have two very different experiences, and it's purely because our energy is different. So, if we can become, I guess, number one, more aware of our energy, um, so that we can have more choice and answer the question, "What's needed here?" Then we've got more of a chance to get it into the right zone to do the work we need to do. And um, and to me, it's a game changer. I mean, when I started to to understand what worked for me, which is which is quite personal, it's it's different from other people. My my work certainly became a lot more fulfilling, a lot more fun. And um, and it's the same for all our clients. Can I? So I just want to throw out some real world scenarios to you. I'm, yeah, I'm fascinated by energy as well um, and the impact it can have. And to your point. It really is palpable. You can walk into a company, um, into their even their lobby, and you can sense where they are almost immediately yeah. by kind of the energy of the people in the room. So let's say I go into a meeting, I'm leading a meeting, and the energy is low, people are feeling beat down. What what can I do? And we've got some challenges to face, as really is every meeting you ever go to, right? Sure. Um, what can I do in that moment for myself and those around me to help shift that energy? Well, so interestingly, you, you, you know, you talk about meetings and actually meetings is one of the biggest energy drainers. I mean, uh, on the planet. for real, you know, it, it, you know, they're too and, long and mostly unnecessary. Absolutely right. And, you know, I mean, the first thing is, you know, I, I'd say actually, do you need a meeting is, is the first thing. So, um, so a lot of the time, I think we have meetings just because it's habit and um, we only get things done when we get together. Um, so, so we spend a lot of time with our clients helping them not go to meetings. And actually, if they do, designing them so that the right meetings with the right people. I was just working in India last week, and a, and a small meeting over there was twelve people. And I'm going, this this is this is not a way to make the most out of your talent. So you know, making sure you set you get the right people for the right job with the right time in the right place makes the difference. But but when you're in there, um, one thing that, that astonishes me is. Um, People don't set up meetings very well. You know, I mean, we've all been in meetings where you know, twenty minutes in, we've gone why am I here again? Um, you know, what do you want from me? So, so getting the setup is key. So the setup is all about, you know, so why are we here? What's the vision of success? What, what personally do we want from the people? You know, what are the behaviors that we want from people? Because a finance meeting is very different to a creative kickabout, you know? So how do you want me to be to make sure that I'm contributing? And then the third thing is how do we get the energy right? And when people come in the room, invariably the energy is wrong. So, you know, if it's a, a creative kick about this, get rid of the desk, let's get rid of the tech. We don't need any of that. You know, let's go on our feet. Let's share a little bit about, you know, why we're excited to be here. Let's do something to recalibrate before we begin. And as we go through that meeting, if we notice it dips, let's do something again. But, you know, it's not one of those things where one size fits all. We have to read the room, read the context, read what it is we're working on, and then adapt depending on Again, what's needed there. But the important thing is you should never look at a room and go, oh, my God, look at this. This is hard work. Change the energy and make it easier and life becomes more fun. So give me some of your favorite um, or even some of your clients' favorite kind of real world tactics that we can do to change our energy in those moments, either when we're feeling it alone at our desk, like, oh, my energy is not here to tackle this or, or in that meeting. Sure. Well, I mean, but basically we can change our, our energy in, in four main ways, physically, mentally, emotionally, or spiritually, right? So physical is the fastest way to change energy. And actually, you know, just moving makes a huge difference. The number one fastest way to get um, more oxygen into your system and therefore more consciousness is to breathe properly. So most people breathe terribly. I, I was one of the worst. I, I was coached for six whole months on how to breathe. But now nailing a good breath 
you know, I can do that while I'm facilitating a meeting without anyone even realizing. So that's a way to make sure that I'm topping myself up. But uh, I can't think when I'm sitting down. So I move quite a lot. So I do quite a lot of physical stuff. Um, you know, mentally, um, you know, getting people to um, to talk about what it is they're most excited about in their work right now. That's a little mental reframe that just helps them, again, gets a little bit of excitement and energy back into the work they do. Um, emotionally, um, getting people to, to talk about, you know, people, um, you know, in the team and what they love about them so that they've got some sort of emotional connection. And there's lots of things that you can do. I mean, there's, there's no end of, of, on the list. Um, the, the important thing is that they've got to be appropriate to the culture, appropriate to the people you're working with. They've got to be fast and effective, and you've got to have a, a plethora of them because you want to be changing them all the time. If you've only got one thing that you do every time, people get very bored very quickly. I'm assuming your body and mind probably integrate that into your routine so they stop working as effectively. Sure. Yeah. Because, you know, we, we start to see it as a habit and then guess what? We're, we're living on life on autopilot. And, you know, my, my last book was all about autopilot and 80% of our lives is led on it. And, and that's great as far, you know, for right, driving long distances and doing routine tasks. But as change is so prevalent in business, you can't w win if you're on autopilot, because when you ask the question, what's needed here on autopilot, it says, well, what I did last time. You know, let's, let's keep doing those same things. So you need to be breaking those habits to keep yourself conscious and make sure you've got the right energy for the work you do. So, you know, I think that's that's a key part for success. So this may be a question out in left field, but it, it just keeps coming up in my head as you're talking, because um, yeah. I think a lot of us, probably including you, have experienced this where the energy is relatively good. You know, people yeah. are happy to be there. It's relatively easy. There's a lot of great collaboration happening, to your point, the right people having the right conversations. Things are moving. And then you've got one or two of those negative energy people or low energy people, however you describe it, I guess, um, oh. who tend to then pull energy in their direction. How do you yeah. deal with that when it's not just an all or none because we're humans, you've got maybe even a majority of the right energy that you're looking for, but then a couple that you know are spoiling the well. Yeah, so look, I'm, I'm ruthless on this one, Tamara. I've got to be honest. I have no time for negativity because um, it, it costs us so much in business. It's extraordinary. If you, the, the latest research on it is, um, is, is stunning. I mean, if you have... Um, an experience with somebody who is negative, you're 100% more likely to be negative yourself, right? So it, it, it impacts every element of us. It makes us less creative. It gives us more... It gives us more of a chance to die young. I mean, there's lots of, lots of things going on with negativity. So I don't tolerate it. Um, so... If it's in a group and we're doing something and somebody's being negative and I've set up the behaviors at the beginning and people are doing something contrary to the behavior, I would just pull them up and say, hey, that behavior we talked about, which was positivity, I've noticed you're not doing that. Can we get back on track? And if they keep persisting, it's a timeout and then we'll have a one-on-one -on -one conversation about it. Um, and if actually they can't get away from that, I, I will, I'll get them out of the meeting. You know, If they're going to hold me up, I'll get them gone. I, I I have to say, as far as teams are concerned, negativity is cancerous. And um, I, I used to do quite a lot of work with, with a guy some years ago who was the head of talent at Apple. And he used to have this, this advice, and it's slightly, um, slightly <laughs> uh, I, I guess, um, uh, raucous advice for, for a, a, a HR professional. But he used to say, do you know what, Chris? It's better to have a hole than an asshole. <laughs> and, uh, you, know, you know what? That's it's fantastic. True. <laughs> it's true. You know, um, so I, so I, I get negativity gone. Um, it's, it's not okay in my business. And I don't think it should be okay in anyone else's, to be honest. That's the best phrase I've heard in a while. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty good, huh? <laughs> yeah, no, it's really good. Uh, so I, I'm going to switch gears a little bit from energy because I, I think – uh, energy is extremely important. But there's something else I really wanted to make sure we had time to talk about, which is your sure. social enterprise called Talk It Out. Yeah, great. Yeah, walking and talking is a form of therapy. And I, I just, I, I'll just, in all honesty, I will tell you when my team first came to me and said, hey, like here's, you know, someone who reached out to us, look at this stuff. I, I'm a pretty, uh, I'm a, what, what am I? I'm a free spirit wrapped up in a type A personality. So right. like, you know, I, I love fluff and stuff, but then I'm also like, give me the hard facts. I want the data. So I, I kind of straddle both. So when I first heard this, I thought, uh, where is this headed and what? And then I looked at the video and started thinking about it and started to realize how I talked to some of my mastermind people. I was like, oh, oh my gosh, this totally, not only does it make sense, but it's really helpful. So now that I've given all the mystique, you know, mystique to it, why don't you tell us what it is? <laughs> 
Sure. So, so t- talking out is it's a creative exercise actually that I've I first wrote about in my first book in 2006, um, and we we trained thousands of people to use it to get better ideas and better insight. But it's amazing how many people were coming back and just saying, Do you know what, I I just feel better. I feel as if a weight has lifted off me. So, we started to research it with um, with the University of Bristol to see actually how good it was as a mental well-being tool. And my belief is that you know we're quite good with our bodies. We we understand how to look after them nutrition with exercise, but we're terrible at looking after our minds. And actually, the challenges we all have right now, you know, those 12-hour days you were talking about and being bombarded by messaging and tech and all this, we need to know how to look after ourselves better, I think. Um, so, so we have now found that the evidence has been, has been you know, amazing. We, 85% of the people who've taken part feel better about who they are and they want to do it again. Um, you know, people have, have, have said that they are, you know, in, through the research, 18% more positive result. Their anxiety has dropped by 15%. So we know it works. And what we love about it is anyone can do it. You know, so it doesn't matter uh, on your skill set, doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter on your sex or your culture. Anyone can do it because actually we're kind of born to process as we walk. And actually, when we talk, we'll access more of our subconscious and therefore we'll get clearer on what's important to us. So um, so we're just trying to get it out into the world. We, we set up the social enterprise with the ambition. Um, and it's a, it's a number that scares me, Tamara. We want to get 10 million people using it in the next three years. Um, and, you know, we're, we're getting it out into the world for free. So if anyone's interested in getting involved, it, um, just check it out on talkingout.org. Um, it's so simple. You, you do it with a buddy and it takes no more than an hour. And I think it's better than going to the gym. So how does it work? It's really simple. So, um, so basically, it's, it's, some, it's some age old um, kind of um, philosophy that's con- com- combined with some kind of modern day psychology. So what you do is you grab a buddy and um, one of you just talks about life and it could be any element of your life. It could be a relationship. It could be work. It could be anything that you've got that you would like to get a bit more clarity on or something that's bothering you, you want to get a shift on. And you just talk flat out. And uh, your, your buddy just listens. They, they don't have a conversation. They don't interfere. They might just make sure you, you stay clear of traffic um, or, in my case, walking through the woods, you know, stray dogs. And, um, and they just look after time. And you just talk. Now, after a while, you will run out of conscious story. Yeah. So we've all got a story in our lives. And it's what we you know, tell our friends, you know, uh, down the pub. Once, once you run out of conscious story, you just keep talking. And that's the stuff then that starts to come up from your subconscious. Now, the stuff that you say doesn't have to be true, doesn't have to be clever. You just have it as a stream of consciousness. Now, every now and again, as you say that, you will notice that you have some type of visceral energetic reaction. You might get cross. You might get excited. You might get stuck. Those are the things that you're saying that you will suddenly go, oh, actually, there's something interesting there. There's something that I have just learned about the topic I'm talking about. And those are the bits to pay attention to. And then after doing that for 20 minutes and walking outside, your buddy can then just say, hey, this is what I heard. This is what I thought was interesting. And you just get to land it. Um, And then you swap and go the other way. And what we we tend to find um, in a very short period of time, just 20 minutes walking and talking, is, is number one, you just get a lot clearer on what's important to you, what's going on in your life, what maybe needs a bit more attention. But you also tend to find that if there are certain things that are bothering people because they've got a stuck perspective, that it tends to free up. They start to see it from other other angles. Um, and often people come back going, do you know what? I just can't wait to get stuck in. I've got some ideas on what I want to do differently with my life. You know, let me at it. So so that's it. It's it's simple. Uh, a couple of questions for you. One is, if I hear you right, it sounds like for, for me, the person talking, the key there is not to filter, to just, just verbal that's blah over, all over the other person. Um, yeah. And just just get it out there, right? And and it really, it's really in alignment with kind of my belief that we all have a lot of we have a lot of the answers inside of us, or at least we a better understanding of where we need to go if we just took a second to process and think. Um, so yeah. that's number one. And to your point, you get through the obvious stuff first, and then you got to fill another fifteen minutes. So you just like it, <laughs> yeah. you, you go deeper, you know, than you would Absolutely. have otherwise. Um, and then on the flip side of that, I think is the one walking. First of all, it's very hard not to interject, isn't it? To just yeah, say, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I, for me, it would be for sure. But it really, it made me think that, wow, that would really also up my active listening skills. Yeah. Because if I but, have to summarize, as you yeah. stated in the end, I've got to really be present to what this person is saying. 
Exactly. I mean, it's funny. We've had thousands of leaders go through this in the, in the last year because we do quite a lot of teamwork where, you know, we, we're seeing the teams trying to sort out their behaviors and kind of where they're at. And, and we do talk it out with them a lot. And um, the number of them that say, do you know what? I just need to listen more. I mean, that's not a bad output. So, I, I, you know, I quite like that. But um, on the talking bit, this this um, not being filtered is key. If you if you if you don't trust the person you're talking to, you'll filter. If you don't just let go and go quite quickly, you'll filter. And it's really important you walk when you do this because uh, M- MIT did a big study and found that our, our creativity spikes by up to 60, 60% when we walk. And, and, and that's because we access our subconscious more when we're kinesthetic. So you have to walk. And I think if you walk at a bit more pace, it helps. Um, but it, but it, makes all, it makes all the difference. Um, I've tried it sitting down. I've tried to do it on my own. It doesn't work. You need those, those, those people to talk to and you need to be out, preferably in nature. That's my favorite. Why does that matter? Well, nature has a huge impact on the way we process again. So it's, it's very good for, you know, helping people with, you know, depression and anxiety. So it's good for your overall energetic state. But there's, there's wonderful stimulus in nature. Um, I mean, it, it works on a street too, but there is just something about nature that it just seems to elevate the level of processing um, that I tend to find for me. And we get a lot of feedback that that's relatively consistent with others too. It's a, it's, it, I suppose it's working a little bit on the... Um, this kind of forest bathing thing that the Japanese are so keen on, where they actually prescribe going off for a walk in the woods if people are feeling down. There is, there is something about being in nature that just helps us feel better. So um, you get a little bit, a bit of a boost from doing it. Well, I couldn't agree more, but I was just curious if it kind of what the why is behind it. Because I mean, I, I always feel better after. I live in Colorado, so yeah. it's pretty easy for me uh, to get to some you're pretty, in a good place. Yeah. Yeah, pretty beautiful nature, but I always feel better. Uh, when I go into nature, whether I'm hiking or just sitting, it doesn't even matter. Just being there makes it better, makes it all better. And maybe it just goes back to our primal caveman days of, you know, we're on this earth and it's part of who we are. I don't know. Absolutely. I mean, I, well, I'm, I'm a huge believer. I mean, I'm looking out at the sea now. Um, we're in a forest. There's woods around us. I'm looking at the sea uh, and the sun's out. And, you know, we, we came here and we run all our retreats here for a very important reason. You know, when when people are in this environment – they are very different, and um, and it's a lot easier for them to feel safe and looked after, and therefore open up and transform here versus in the centre of London. There's no doubt about it. I've done both many, many, many times. Nature wins. I think too. There's something really powerful in getting out of the environment that's causing the challenge to begin with. Sure, um, absolutely. Not so much about sure. nature specifically, but if you're in an office, if you're you know trying to figure out how to grow revenues, whatever, and you're sitting at your desk having that conversation, you're surrounded by everything that's caused you to be where you are. Yeah. Versus even if like if you can't get all the way out in nature, at least going to a park or whatever, something to get you out of the environment that kind of has sti- has stifled your thinking to begin with. Uh, I totally agree with that. So I think that makes a big difference. And, and then the other thing is, you know, I, I talked about the energies, uh, physical, mental, emotional, spiritual. You know, nature has amazing connectivity, which is spiritual energy. And it just gives you that boost that makes you realize actually, you know, where our place is in this universe. And, and actually, we're not alone. And actually, it's a pretty good place to be. And sometimes, you know, people to have that shift, um, they just need to feel, you know, a little bit loved, a little bit looked after, a little bit nurtured rather than beaten up and just, you know, doing the treadmill of 12 hour days. So, um, so nature does, does a lot of that work for us. And I'm, you know, eternally grateful to it. I want to go back a question about talk it out for a second about you had, yeah. you had said it quickly, but I think it's an important point. Um, and I want to follow up with a few questions about trusting the person you're walking with so that you're not filtering, sure. which is obviously extremely important because the right. filtering is not going to help. We all know no. that. Um, sometimes I, f- I think that we don't trust the other person because we think they have an agenda that they may or may not have. Um, it's our own assumptions that put that lack of trust into the relationship. And can sure. you get to a place of trust by doing this exercise? Th- okay, that's question one. So we'll start there and then I'll go to my other questions. Yeah. Yeah. So, so um, this certainly builds trust. So I do this a lot with leadership teams and get them to do this in pairs. And, um, and I often do it where the relationship's a bit broken. And you will find that they have built trust by doing so. But I think it's important there's a clear setup so that they understand why they're doing it, what goes on tour stays on tour. You know, we will not share this conversation. Um, and, and, you know, and, and the other thing that really helps is you go both ways, right? So if you're going both ways, you both have to be vulnerable. 
and you both have to give it a go, which, which I think helps a lot. Um, but obviously, if you do have a relationship with somebody that's so broken that you, you just don't feel you can trust, I wouldn't do it with them. I'd do it with somebody else. And, and actually, one of the things we're working on at the moment is we're building a community where people can phone in and actually have an anonymous person on a headset doing it with them. Um, and, and I think there's some benefit to doing that. We, we've certainly had people doing it in different languages with people where they don't understand the other person's language. And, and actually, bizarrely, it works brilliantly because you're not listening to the detail of what they say. You're listening to the energy changes. So what So what you would do is if somebody's going off in Portuguese and you don't understand it, if you felt the energy change, you just say, you've just said something important. What was it? And they translate it in English and carry on. And we've had massive breakthroughs. And because obviously they don't, you know, the other person doesn't know what they're saying, they feel completely unfiltered. So... There's some fun games you can play with this. I So just going back to the trust thing for a second, I can yeah. see how in a team that maybe has a little bit of distrust, maybe not like deep to the core, but they don't work well together or there's a little bit of, you know, we do all the work, that team doesn't. Sure. That kind of kind of, I don't want to call it generic, but common team trust issues, how something like this could really work. And what you were just saying about anonymous kind of led me to my next question, which is, um, you know, I think there's a lot of uh, importance uh, in being able to cross pollinate thinking and ideas and people not just constantly going to the same well all the time. So how yeah. do you use this exercise to it, how do you in this exercise ensure that you're not just like, Chris, do I would I always go to you because, hey, let's face it, I trust you and we work really well together. That's awesome. But really branch out a little bit and get to people who I wouldn't normally connect with. Yeah, so I mean, if you're using this as a well-being tool, um, you know the important thing is you've got you've got trust there. But beyond trust, you don't need expertise. So move it around a little bit, and 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 people will pick up different things from from you. So so I think variety is really important. If you're doing this on creativity, I mean, you know, for 15 years of my life, all I taught was creativity and innovation. And uh, you know, so many people go and brainstorm with the same people yeah. in the same rooms over with the same again. techniques, with the same <laughs> you know, you know. stimulus, the same everything. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And what I love about this technique is anyone can do it, right? So, so I, I've done, you know, brainstorms with, you know, some of the biggest, best companies in the world where I've got people to go and do, talk it out for an hour and they do half an hour each way on the topic and they've come back with some of the best ideas. And the people that came back with the best ideas were introverted and they were reflective and they were, they were deemed not to have any experience on it. But you know what? They were just brilliant creatively when they were given this opportunity. So I think this is a more inclusive way of helping those quieter people who don't shout too loud, but have amazing brains get in the room and actually deliver the results. So I love it. Oh, interesting. I, I, I really appreciate what you're saying about, you know, I think oftentimes people like me who are really loud and extroverted tend to dominate a brainstorm. And then you miss the opportunity to get to the people who are quiet, reflective, shy, introvert, need to process differently, which is really a shame because their ideas are equal, but they're just yeah. not as vocal. Absolutely. So, yeah, th this is a great leveler for that. Yeah. I'm curious, in your work, what do you think stops people from innovating more often? I mean, we know we have to adapt to change. So what keeps us from doing that? Um, I, I, I suppose it depends on what level. I mean, um, you know, on, on a corporate level, so many things. I mean, you know, um, you know, leadership, um, strategy, um, the culture. I mean, culture is number one. If, you know, if you don't have the right culture for it, forget it. You know, um, so, so so that gets in the way. On, on an individual level, I mean, you know, a lot of people aren't skilled in it. They're not taught how to do it, and there are skills involved, and you can't just. It go, hey, everyone, have great innovative ideas because it just doesn't happen that way. You need to invest in the right people um, and you need to reward them for it and create the sustaining structures around them so that they feel as if, number one, it's their job and they're excited by it. And, and actually, if they get it wrong, they still get supported. And actually, if they do do it, things are actually implemented, you know, and something will change. And, you know, getting all that right is not easy. It's not easy because there's a lot of working parts around there. Yeah. And I would say that to kind of your comment about the right people, I would say everybody is the right person. We all should be innovating more mm -hmm. in the work that's right in front of us. Um, the challenge is recognizing how you innovate and having the, to your point, the culture and the backing and the permission yeah. and the implementation, right? So it's not just a black hole Absolutely. to do that. But I think that um, siloing innovation to certain people is a mistake for an organization, but getting people to recognize how they can do it with what's right in front of them is where companies win and people win. Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. I, I, my, I suppose my only, um, my only take on that would be 
if, it, if it's incremental innovation, everyone can do it. If you want disruptive innovation, then I don't think everyone can necessarily. And I don't think you can structure it to make it culture wide. I think that takes a, a more specific approach from my, from my experience. Um, I'm, I'm sure some people are doing it really well. I, I just always found that a bit difficult. So I, kinda, I, th- I think it kind of comes down to the type of innovation you're trying to deliver. Yeah, no, I don't disagree. I think, um, well, I think disruptive is one of those funny words that everybody uses differently. (laughs) It depends on the company. I mean, same with innovation and creativity, to be honest. Um, I I think that it's amazing to me how many people have ideas on how to solve things because they're doing the job. And that's not to say that you shouldn't have an innovation team that enables innovation or works on those crazy ideas that aren't meant to be implemented right away. But there's so much opportunity for innovation that makes a huge impact yeah. that's not the far off, we're not there yet innovation um, yeah, that's I overlooked agree. because we focus on disruptive and we forget, hey, you know what? An internal shift in our process would actually save yeah. us millions of dollars. I totally agree. And if you look over the last 100 years, you know, 80% of the value of innovation has been that type of innovation. It's the incremental stuff. And, 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 and people, because I think people don't see that as quite so sexy, they haven't invested in it. And, and, and I, I totally agree. That's, that's stuff that we should all be doing. And, and actually, that's where the culture you really needs to be there because actually if you get the culture right, it supports it. And that's the fun stuff for me. You know, I, I, I've done enough of this kind of, you know, setting up SWAT teams, you know, with loads of funding to do amazingly big stuff. And actually that's, that's not the value. The value is everyone rocking up every day to make everything better. And that's exciting. Well, that's why I love your kind of whole concept around energy and, and managing the energy um, is yeah. so important because I think if the energy across the organization, I mean, we wouldn't just have a 10 people have good energy and everybody no. else is like, meh. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the power, right? That is the power. Yeah, no, and I think energy is critical. And I just to kind of close it out a little bit. I love the talk it out strategy. I like I said, I was a little suspicious at first. I get um, it. Yeah, yeah, but the, you're right. The research actually shows it. But it is just so interesting to see how because I did a little bit of a test with a call. I mean, we weren't as good at it as I could be now that I've talked to you. But I decided I'm just going to talk for 15 minutes about something that's bothering me at work. And by the end, I was like, well, that was obvious. Totally know what the answer is now. And that was, they didn't even sum it up. I just kind of got there by talking for 15 minutes. But we we just don't tap all that inner knowledge and ideas that we have. We just, we stay superficial and move on. I totally agree. And, and, and it's just so easy. Just get from your desk, go for a stroll, have a quick chat. You know, it, and, and everyone always comes back amazed by how quick it is. That's what I love. It takes no planning and no preparation and it's really fast. And yet, you know, most of the time when people want to think differently, you know, they get around a flip chart in a room with a boardroom and, uh, you know, and, and it just doesn't work. Right. So, so I, I love it for that. And, and of course, for me, I'm most excited about the fact that it's a therapeutic benefit. And, and actually, when you talk about life, when you talk about the things that, you, that are bothering you that you just want to get some clarity on. It delivers. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. And, and I really uh, appreciate also it's kind of secondary value of helping build trust and yeah. maybe in teams that don't know each other or teams that maybe just have some underlying stress that they're dealing with um, and in managing people who are, who are not at the right energy level. Because the reality is there's always one. Yeah, yeah. I hope for sure. <laughs> where do they come from? And do they just bounce from company to company? Are we all dealing with the same person? Who is this person? Well, I, I was just reading that, you know, we all know one psychopath. You know, oh so um, there you go. <laughs> That's a little frightening. You know what scares me Isn't more it? is I can't think of who that is. So does that mean it's me? <laughs> <laughs> That's the worry, right? <laughs> All right. Before we close, before I ask you the last question, where and we'll put the link in the show notes uh, for what you mentioned already. But where can people go to learn more and connect with you? Sure. Well, if you just check out Upping Your Elvis, um, you'll, you'll find our website um, for the talk. It out. It's, it's talk dash it dash out.org. Um, check us out there. And I've got, um, I've got a website for the, for my kind of books and stuff, which is Chris Barrows Brown. So check, check us out on those places. We're pretty active. And I would really encourage all of us on Mon Street to go check out um, and join Talk It Out because it really, it's, it's, it works. And it's so, to your point, Chris, it's so simple, yet so incredibly effective. Uh, no, I, I think it's a game changer and we all need a bit of help. So um, yeah, give it a go. Yeah. So, okay. What's your final piece of advice for those of us trying to up our Elvis? So my, my big piece of advice would be, um, you know, don't, don't settle for anything but an extraordinary life. You know, we, we don't have that many days on this planet. A third of our days on this planet are work days and therefore we should be loving it. And, you know, I believe that you've all got what you need to do to, you know, 
do incredible work. We've got to be jumping out of bed, loving who we are, loving what we do. And if it's not feeling like that, change something, shift those energies, you know, do, do something about where you work, how you work, make sure that you're, you're fizzing and buzzing. And then, you know what, it, it changes everything. And, um, and you'll have to constantly change, change course because naturally our energies change, but it, it, when you get attuned to it, life just becomes way more fun. And like I said, way more easy. You know, Chris, what I think is so powerful about that advice is actually wrapped up in what you've been talking about to me this whole time, which is if it's not just about, you know, jumping off the ladder that you're on and finding a whole new ladder. I think that's actually really scary, but about making that ladder work for you and and changing the energy and talking it out and all these things you're talking about can actually shift what you've already got to be that thing that you want. And, and, and when I used to work with them, they always go off and get new jobs. And I honestly think I failed. Um, because, because actually it's so easy to think everything else is, you know, the grass is greener, you know, th- uh, there's no such thing as a perfect job. I mean, I know fashion photographers and musicians and all sorts of people, and there's bits of their job they hate, you know, everyone's got that. And our mission is to craft that job to fit us. And, and, and that's the game. And when you, when you start to do that, you realize what's possible, I think. Well, I think that that's a huge and important distinction, um, yeah. for all of us listening to say, Hey, let, let's start, you know. Where does it say bloom where you're planted? Is that what someone said to me once? Um, and But actually changing the soil around you so you can actually make that happen. Yeah, I, I'm with you on that tomorrow. Well, Chris, thank you so much for coming by. I feel like I talked it out a little bit with you, which is kind of nice. So thank you. <laughs> I loved it. It's been great. Um, thank you for having me. Thanks for hanging with us on Inside Launch Street. If you know someone that is truly ready to unlock their innovation advantage, have them join you on Launch Street. Discover your innovation advantage. Build a team of high-performing innovators and ignite ideas and solutions that create massive impact. G-O-T-O, LaunchStreet.com. Remember, innovators, if you don't take the leap, somebody else will.